Hey everybody, today Rado runs through Essen Spiel 2022. Yes, it's here finally at long last. In just a few days on October 6th, the world's biggest board game convention is going to be live. And according to Board Game Geek, there are going to be 1,000. 183 games there. And that's a lot of games. And in fact, actually, there's probably going to be a lot more. But these are the 1,183 that Eric Martin, the board game geek news hound who gets all the information from all the publishers and presents them in this wonderful, wonderful preview list, which if you'd like to check it out for yourself, there's a link for it down in the show notes, folks. Eric, as always, thank you so much for doing all the legwork. I have done some work as well. I have spent I don't know how many hours personally looking at every one of those 1,183 games and labeling them must-have, thinking about it, or not interested. That took me quite a while, and I'm going to share some of the fruits of that labor with you right now. I'm going to give you two top tens. My first top ten will be all the games from that list, or the best ten games, I should say, from that list that I have already played. Because, of course, running the Rado channel, I often get to uh, check out games that uh, get early when re when review copies get sent out. Sometimes uh, I cover games e months, even years early uh, when I'm doing uh, Kickstarter previews. So there's going to be... 10 games that are absolute must-have. There's more than that, but I'm going to tell you the 10 best, and I'm speaking from experience because I've played these games myself with my wife. After that top 10, I will do another one. 10 games that I haven't played, but that look really amazing to me. And uh, that's going to be a little bit more subjective. And of course, there are so many more I could talk about than just these 20 games. And in fact, I am going to. Every month, for backers of my show, I do an exclusive video called The Rotto Ramble. You can watch it if you're a member here on YouTube, or if you back me on Patreon. You can hit that I in the top right corner of the screen to learn more. And in my ramble, for the month of October. I'm not going to talk about just these 20 games. I'm probably going to talk about... I haven't filmed it yet. I'm filming it right after this. Probably upwards of 200 games or so. I'll tell you down in the show notes how many more games and expansions I will be covering. Because here, I'm just talking about new games at the show that are for sale. Another thing that I'm actually leaving off this list is games that are on the wonderful uh, preview that have already been out for weeks or even months, in some cases even years. I am talking about just new stuff that is debuting at the show. That's what you're getting right now, but if you want more, folks, again, hit that I to uh, maybe consider backing the show, just even for one month, so you can watch this month's ramble and hear about oh, a whole lot more stuff. But self-advertisement um, aside, let's move on for what you're here to see, folks. You want to hear about 20 games? I'm going to tell you about 20 games, starting with number 10 on my... And remember, these are the games I have already played, right? These are the games I've already played. Number 10 on that list is Sans Souci, which is actually... I'm actually already breaking the rule I said a bit ago. This game came out from Kramer and Key or just Michael Kiesling years ago, back in 2013. But it has been out of print forever. And uh, recently, if I recall correctly, a Brazilian publisher got the rights uh, to it and have published a new edition, which I have played, and it is excellent. Uh, just as excellent as the game has always been. These are pictures of the original version. The new version has gotten a graphical overhaul and all of that. Here's the reason I put this on on the list. Not only is San Shushi one of the greatest tile lane games of all time, from one of the greatest board game designers of all time, but it, and not only has it been out of print forever, and not only has it just recently gotten reprinted, it's going to be at the show in incredibly limited capacity. I believe I read on Board Game Geek, they're going to have something like 100 copies of it. So that's it, folks. And if you have, if you are a uh, Michael Kiesling fan, you know Mr. Azul, and you would like to see one of his greatest designs of all time, this might be one of your few chances to do it, unless you live in South America. Um, so I, I could not, in good conscience, uh, skip over San Shushi. Again, one of the greatest... Uh, ones of all time. Oh, by the way, the new version actually comes with a nice little additional variant designed by Mr. Kiesling thrown in uh, for good measure. So, anyway, 
That's number 10, San Suu Kyi. Now, number 9 on the list is Oak from Game Brewer. And this is a gorgeous worker placement game, as Game Brewer games generally are. And there's a lot to talk about here. You can watch, uh, for all these first 10 videos, you can watch my run-throughs and previews I've done of them. I've done a preview for Oak. It is a worker placement game all about druids in touch with nature, um, you know, trying to do a whole bunch of euro -y stuff. Gather and ingredients, make artifacts, all kinds of things. And the game is a blast. It's really fun and crunchy, but I will be honest, what really sells me on it is your workers. Um, because you start out with regular workers uh, that you can send to do all the different kind of worker placement actions, you know, build housing for your workers, and uh, like I said, harvest resources, all kinds of stuff. But over the course of the game, you can upgrade them. And the game comes with these really, really cool pieces that snap onto the existing workers so that you can see, oh no, that's a super worker now. And they have additional benefits when you send them to certain spaces. It turns them into really superpower characters if you can use them at the right place. And the tricky thing is, once you've got them upgraded, you want to use them in the places where they'll be super beneficial, but often because, oh, that space is blocked and it's too expensive to go there, now I've got to send my super worker to a regular place and go pick up mushrooms. Ah, this is so wasteful. So there's this wonderful, I mean, I always am looking in a worker placement game for something that does something new and different. And Oak definitely delivers. It's a blast. And again, I've already played it. If you'd like to know more, you can go check out my preview for number nine, Oak. All right. You know what? I'm going to put previews for all the ones I filmed down in the show notes as well. I just decided that, making executive decisions. So if you want to know more about Oak, follow the link down in the show note. But now, let's move on to number eight, Sabika. A brand new game. I just put my run-through for this up the other day, and oh my goodness. This is probably going to be a top ten of the year for me. And you know what? I just heard my phone beep. Hold on. Okay, I'm back. I had to uh, reschedule a call that I was going to do later today for later. Not that that's of any importance to you. Uh, everybody, send good wishes to Rel Gaviola. He just had a bad tooth taken out yesterday, and he just does not feel up to our previously scheduled thing. Ruel! My thoughts are with you, as are everybody else's. Anyway, though, continuing. What was I talking about? Sabika. By the way, Sabika is from the designer of last year's big hit, Bitoku. And as far as I'm concerned, Sabika is an even better design. It is about building the Alhambra. It's a big, crunchy, heavy Euro with lots of moving parts, literally, because this is a rondelle within a rondelle within a rondelle game. And I know this isn't the first game to do it, but it really pushes this idea to all kinds of extremes. Each rondelle requires different types of workers and gives you access to different benefits. Um, you know, Players all share the same rondelle, and it gets tight and compact. Because you can go to an occupied space, but then you have to pay extra. So often, you'll find yourself, okay, I really want to do this action right now, but you're in the way! And if you could move your poet out of the way so I could move my poet into that space to do the thing so I don't have to pay extra, well, what can I do? Okay, I can move my merchant right now, but I don't really have a good use for my merchant. If I did my builder first, but now you're annoying my builder, too! So, um, it's a constant traffic jam on this incredibly tight uh, and, you know, tension-filled triple rondelle game where you're doing all the wonderful Euro stuff. Uh, you know, building up the, the major elements of the Alhambra, carving poetry into the walls of the Alhambra, and, um, you know, following all kinds of... You know, chasing after racing for different public objectives to be able to score lots of points. It's really, really great. Again, like I'm not, I'm not going to keep saying this. You can check out my run-through. The link is down in the show notes. I really enjoyed it. My wife I've enjoyed it even more. Number eight on this short list of Essence Spiel games, Sabika. Let's move on to number seven, Teletum, which I've been excited about for a long, long time because it is from the design super team of Luciani and Testini. And when these two get together, they make really special stuff. And I would definitely say this uh, satisfies that uh, parameter. Oh my gosh, this game is wonderful. It is a multi-use dice drafting game, where every round, um, players are going to take turns. You know what? Oh, this is a whole bunch. There we go. Uh, take turns. Oh. Come on, Board Game Geek. Give me some useful pictures. These are useless pictures. Whoever posted these pictures is not really helping sell the game. Uh, not at all. Fine. Rotto. Um, no, I haven't put some video yet, have I? Oh, it has, hasn't gone up yet. Anyway, though. All right. Let's just go back to that one uh, zoomed out picture then, because all these zoomed in pictures, I, I I should have actually spent a little bit of time making sure there'd be good pictures on all these games. I just assumed there would be. So um, 
Yeah, is this a picture gonna help? No, because you can't see the most important element. Oh, whoever you were, that's a nice picture of your board, but not the main board. Sorry, folks. Let's just go back to the game setup. All right. This is the one picture I will show. Uh, but publishers, post more pictures of your games on Board Game Geek. Do you not want to sell your games to people? Anyway, um, so uh, at the beginning of every round, the game takes place over four rounds, a bunch of dice are going to be drawn, rolled, and put around this circle, uh, grouped by um, number on the die, and then you're going to take turns grabbing them. When you grab a pink three that's in the royalty section, that means three things. You uh, The pink means, oh, I'm going to collect some food. Specifically, three food, because the number three was on it. And because it was in the royalty section of this wheel, I will then do four royalty manipulation actions. If it was in the traveling the land, I would get to do four actions of you know moving around and building trade houses and whatnot. This uh, is, there's so much riding on every single die you take and every single die your opponents take that you were hoping to get that it's just absolutely wonderful. I love multi-use cards. I think I love multi-use dice even more and Teletum delivers on that in a big way. Now, the rest of the game is, like I said, kind of very old-fashioned, really. Uh, you know, very, uh, you know, retro, like Hansa Tukanica, uh, turn and taxes type stuff. You've got a big parchment board of a map of Europe and you're moving around. You know, building, uh, you know, aiding the construction of cathedrals, doing trade houses, gathering resources. But the number one thing you gather, uh, more than anything else in this game, are bonus tiles. This game's cup overfloweth with bonuses. You get a bonus tile, you get a bonus tile, bonus, 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 bonus. There's bonus tiles all over the place for racing to be the first to visit different cities in Europe and also for being the first to grab dice from the different wedges of the wheel. That's a fourth thing that your die choice comes into. What color is it? What number is it? Um, what bonus will you get? How, how many resources will you get? How many? And what action is associated with it? Oh, I love it! I love when one single decision has so much impact on everything. And that's what makes this game come to life. But there's one other thing that's super... Two other things that are super important. One, while you are constantly getting bonus tiles that can create super powerful combo chain strings that are so satisfying, you are really limited because you only can store four of them at any time. And that storage is also where you put your contracts that you're trying to complete for points and your rich nobles that you're trying to influence and um, your a family crest that you're trying to influence as well. So you've got a lot of income, but a very, very tight storage space that makes for a lot of challenging things. And the last thing about this game that is so wonderful is you play through four rounds and it randomly set up as power setup. At the end of every round, there is going to be a fair in one city somewhere in Europe. And often they are on the far opposite sides of Europe. And if you want to uh, get points for having achieved objectives in that fair, which is how you could potentially win the game, you need to get all the way over there. And so it creates this path for you throughout the game. But instead of having to be at every city at the right place at the right time, if you build trade houses, you can. it's like you're there all the time. And so there's a race for that. There's a race for everything in this game. It is absolutely delightful. My run-through is going to be going up in a few days. And uh, yeah, uh, there's no uh, getting around it. Teletum is fantastic. It is my number seven uh, most anticipated game that I played for Essence Spiel. Let's move on to uh, number six, Endless Winter. Now, this one I played many, many years ago when it was on Kickstarter, and it's finally coming out from designer Stan Kordonsky. And, um, you know, it's interesting. I played this. Remember a few years ago when there was like this weird confluence of, oh, look, Lost Ruins of Arnak is a really cool game that mixes worker placement and deck building. And it came out right within a month or so of Dune Imperium, which was a really, really cool popular game that mixes um, deck building with worker placement. There was a third game that year that was on Kickstarter. It was Endless Winter. And for my money, it did the mix of worker placement and... Um, deck building better than either of the other two and um, to such great effect we are uh, in uh, you know uh, Paleolithic times in the Americas trying to um, help our tribes succeed doing all kinds of things and a big part of the game is drafting cards to add to your deck but the interesting thing is every turn you are sending one of your very limited workers you have some normal workers and some super and one super worker your tribe leader to do different actions on the board but you also have a hand of cards and you could send out just a little wuss to go hunting but they won't do very well but anytime you send your worker out you can supplement them with cards from your hand uh, your elders and your scouts and all of that and so the more you do that to make a given worker do a very very powerful 
action, that's really great. But then you don't have cards in your hand to, um, wow. Come on, where are the pictures showing off the final version of the game as opposed to prototype um, stuff? Oh, I should have just put my video on screen, but I didn't, but that's okay. Um, you can go check out my run through. Oh, that looks like a good picture there. We'll stick with that one. Thank you, Diddle74. That's a pretty good picture. So you can send your workers um, out just by themselves. They'll do weak actions. You can supplement them with your cards, but you don't refill your hand until the end of a round. So the more you give uh, one of your cards to this worker, the weaker all your subsequent workers will be. It's a simple idea. It's absolutely brilliant. It creates some very, very compelling gameplay. And um, it looks gorgeous too, with beautiful art from the Miko and wonderful miniatures based on the Miko's art, which is something that the world needs more of. So, Endless Winter Paleo Americans comes in at number six. All right, then. Let's go on to number five. Hamburg, which is from my favorite designer of all time, Stefan Feld. And this is really kind of standing in for several games. Um, Hamburg is from a redesign, a re-implementation of an earlier Feld design called Bruges. For a lot of people, Bruges is their favorite Feld of all time. My wife really loves Bruges a lot. And as far as I'm concerned, Hamburg takes the core gameplay of Bruges and improves on it so much that it becomes, it, it has worked its way into my top 10 favorite Feld games. And Bruges was not in my top 10 Felds, but Hamburg is. And it's finally going to be available. And I should say, this is kind of a stand in. There are several games for Feld at the show. There's this, there's uh, New York, which, if I recall correctly, re implements Rialto. And then there's. Amsterdam, which I think re implements Macau. And then there's actually a new game um, called. Uh Marrakesh as well. So there's a lot of Feld going on at Essen Spiel this year, but of all of them, of the ones I've played anyway, Hamburg is the one that comes out on top, so it gets the slot as number five on the list. Okay, then let's go on to number four. Probably the one people haven't heard of very much, Federation. And again, this is another one I covered on Kickstarter. Links for the previewer. I said I wasn't going to say anymore. I just said it. But go check this out. I get, probably most of you have not heard of this, um, which is uh, understandable. It's a relatively new publisher. It's not particularly well-known designers. But oh my gosh, Jen and I fell so hard in love with this game. And now, in part, that's because it's got really wonderful worker placement, um, where every worker, kind of in a Brussels 1893 way, has multiple functions. And when you put your workers out on the board, you are doing an action, you are gaining influence with different members of this intergalactic federation, you are also casting votes for game-changing events that you may want to happen or you may not want to happen. So every one of your workers has multiple functions, which I love. I mentioned earlier, I love multi-use cards, I love multi-use dice, I love multi-use workers too. Um, you know, trying to squeeze more things into one tight decision is always great. Um, so the gameplay here is fantastic. Really nice and thematic, especially Actually especially if you're a Star Trek fan like me. Because, you know, there's a lot of Star Trek games out there. There's a lot of games that take inspiration from Star Trek. But they always focus on the Starfleet side of Star Trek. Nobody ever focuses on the um, Federation of Planets um, side. And that's what this game is. Because all of our workers are basically senators um, in the um, Federation Senate Council trying to keep the entire Federation moving along smoothly. And I love that theme. And um, the gameplay is absolutely fantastic too. Not for nothing, it's also a looker. Very bright and colorful. All these uh, live pictures taken from a convention don't really sell that. There you go. You get a little, I mean, almost has kind of like a Vegas vibe, but you can see it actually kind of has a corner of the Imperial Senate from the uh, Star Wars prequels going on, but with very much a Star Trek thing where every time you put your workers down, you are, um, you know, getting majorities in rows, you're activating things in columns, you're doing the action of space. Oh, it's so good. It is number four on my list of must-haves. Federation. Then let's go on to number three. Come together right now at Essence Spiel. Won't you? Oh my goodness, this is great. This is a uh, nice crunchy Euro from, um, let's see, who are, oh, I, I, um, Eilis Venson was one of the designers, and if I recall correctly, I think he was working with his brother and somebody else. Uh, regardless, uh, it's got a great design pedigree. Eilis Venson is fast becoming one of my favorite designers of all time. 
please show me a picture of the game zoomed out. Nope, only extreme zoom into the picture. Okay, we'll go with this one. It's another worker placement game. And actually, thinking about this now, it didn't occur to me until just now, I've got a lot of worker placement games on my list. And that's surprising because I'm not the biggest worker placement fanboy in the universe. But regardless, this one is so great because we are trying to organize um, a multi-day Woodstock-style rock festival in the Summer of Love. And um, we have workers who are they're called our volunteers that we send out to you know build the stages build you know maintain campgrounds for attendees try to get um you know stars to arrive you know I'm, 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 um, you know worry about getting advertising in the local paper or national wide magazines or on the radio so we're sending all our workers out but the thing is our workers don't do anything immediately our workers well they sometimes depending on where they go they might do a little bit of a just kind of a little side bonus thing but they won't do their main action that you want them to do until somebody uses a worker to activate and entire region of the worker placement board. And then all workers in that region, mine and yours, all activate. And so once somebody starts going to a region, other people want to go to that region because they know, hey, eventually somebody's going to want to activate that. And when um, when one player activates a region, everybody in that region benefits. So you want to be able to piggyback off the functions of other people. And it's great. I mean, it's a great looking game too. It really has that flower power vibe in spades. It's got lots of really fun little in-jokes on the cards for the different bands, uh, referencing you know, real-world bands and also referencing real-world games, and incredibly crunchy, heavy gameplay, which I demonstrated in my run-through, and which these pictures do not really show off. But um, suffice to say, folks, Come Together is fantastic. I absolutely adore it. Another real strong contender for top 10 of the year for me, uh, having played it with my wife, Jen. Let's move on now to number two. Woodcraft. Now, this is a candidate for probably my wife's top three games of the year, and it'll probably make my top ten as well. Because whenever Vladimir Suki uh, makes a puts out a new game through his little independent label, Delicious Games, I am there. He's teamed up with a new designer, Ross Arnold, and the two of them have actually done some really good... Uh, what do you call them? Uh, designer diaries, which I've read. They go into the behind the scenes of how they work together and what parts of the design are Ross's and what parts of the designs are Vladimir. But you don't care about uh, you know that inside baseball stuff, folks. You just want to know. Tell me about the game. Hey, well done. There's a good picture of the game. Uh, delicious games. Other publishers. More of this on Board Game Geek, please. Uh, so you can sell your game to people who are trying to find out what the game is. Anyway, regardless. Sorry. Off my high horse. This is a game where everybody's running their own little fantasy woodland woodworking shop. And um, the central mechanism that drives it is this gigantic buzzsaw that moves. Uh, you know, this is not the first time Vladimir Suchi has done this kind of stuff like that. It kind of feels a little bit Praga put Regni. But this is, for me, so much better. Because as the buzzsaw moves and makes um, actions that everybody's ignored more valuable and makes recently done actions uh, less valuable, it does this really cool almost advent calendar type thing where there's little peekaboos there's there's um holes as as the as it um as the buzz saw rotates uh, the and the little hole windows um move over areas you can see oh boom there's a new um benefit for this particular action that nobody's taking yet yes i will take that action now the, so the action selection mechanism is just fun it has a sense of whimsy and it's always great when a board game moves it doesn't sit there static but then the game itself is really brilliant too because the the other really cool thing about this is Ross's idea, if I recall correctly, is the way your primary resource in this game, wood, you have other resources like uh, glue and saw blades and stuff like that, but your primary resource of wood is represented by colored dice. Um, green dice is the, the new wood, brown dice is the old aged wood, and the bigger a number, if you have a brown four, that means you have basically, potentially, four planks of really aged wood. You Everybody has a collection of uh, projects they have to make, because all the woodland um, creatures and people have come saying, oh, I need a chess set, or I need a baby crib, or whatever I might need. And, oh, by the way, the art on all these is lovely, because there's all kinds of little woodland critters and stuff like that. Very charming game. But, um, you, you know, it's a recipe you have to fill. Oh, I need um, two brown ones and a green three. So, a big part of this game is drafting dice. But often, you can't, you have to have the exact correct die, and the correct die isn't there. I need a green three. There is no green three. There is a green five, though. And what you can do is, oh, I'll take that green five, because later on, I'll use one of my buzz saws that I have, one of my uh, resources, to split that down the middle and turn my green five into a green three and a green two. Now, one die has become two. I use 
a green tree for the crib I'm trying to build. And then I decide, what am I going to do with this green too? You know what? I'm going to plant this because there's a little bit of magic and that's going to start growing to become another green three, green four, green five that I could then harvest later on and saw it into a bunch of little size ones to do some other job. It's brilliant. I love everything about this game. Uh, my wife loves it even more than me. No surprise, since it's our number two, Woodcraft. But number one has to go to Revive. And Ilif Svensson is back with Christian Osby and two other wonderful designers, um, Helga uh, Meisner and Anna Vermlund. I, they've been working on this game for years. Again, some very nice... Uh, designer diaries, if you like behind-the-scenes stuff for this game. But uh, the game itself is great. It's the far future. The far, far future. Nobody knows why. What brought about mankind's fall? But everybody has ideas. But we're finally coming out of the caves. The Great Thaw is finally upon us. The world is starting to revive. And the main board is covered with ice and snow. But over the course of the game, you'll be able to explore and flip these tiles to reveal um, all kinds of opportunities. Ruined cities that you can repopulate. Uh, farmlands that you can grow stuff. Uh, you know, All kinds of ancient artifacts that you'd like to pick up along the way. So you've got the one half of the game is exploring the world, revealing tiles and trying to take advantage. If somebody reveals something, you might be on the other side of the world and say, oh my god, you revealed exactly what I want. I'm going to spend all my resources to zip across this map as fast as I can to get there and get in on that action because players are really interlinked. Even though we're all competing to get the best stuff, this is a very live and let live game for the most part. The real juicy part of the game though is your own player board, which is a triple engine builder. Because as you're doing various things, you unlock by removing these discs from the board which score you points elsewhere, you use those discs, you unlock different um, elements of your machine that you get to run by spending energy. And so, over the course of the game, your machine gets bigger and more elapsed. Uh, uh, you know, um, uh, why did I say elapsed? Your machine gets bigger and more um, complex. Uh, your The world gets bigger with more opportunities. And that's all great, but what truly makes this game wonderful Multi-use cards. Did I mention I love multi-use stuff, folks? Here's the deal. You have a handful of cards that represent your tribe members. When you play a card, you can slip it under the bottom of your um, board to activate, uh, you know, basically harvest resources, or under the top of your board to activate actions. And so every card has two uses. There's a lot more to it than that. Sometimes cards can combo with other cards. You can unlock extra slots. You can upgrade the slots you're putting cards in so that if you put the correct matching cards that match the upgrade you've done, your cards will do even more stuff, but here's the most beautiful thing. Once I put some cards in, cards are kind of my workers in these worker placement slots around my board, I'm like, oh, I can't use that slot anymore. I would love to put another thing there. You come along and you say, oh, that card you just played is wonderful. I'd like to do that action too, please. And so, you can um, copy the function of my card, and you might think, oh, well, what? Oh, that's that's terrible. That's uh, you know getting something for nothing. But I get something. I get to take that card out of its slot, put it in the discard pile, which means it's going to get back to my hand that much faster. Otherwise, it takes a long time to get your cards out of these slots. But if other players copy your actions, the cards come out of the slots, which gives you more free places to do actions, and it gives you your sweet, sweet cards that much faster. And I love that. I love players creating opportunities for each other. Live and let live. Uh, the whole underlying message of this game is, hey, you know what? Countless generations ago, humanity messed everything up. Let's not do it again. Let's actually find a way to work together, even if we're competing. And I love the message. I love the presentation. I love the gameplay. I love everything about my number one game that I have played that I would definitely pick up at Essence Spiel, Revive. Okay. Phew. That is half of the list, folks. But... You're in it for the long haul, right? Well, let's go on. Um, let's see here. Two. Uh, you know what? Actually, hold on a second. I'm very thirsty. I'll be right back. Okay, I'm back. And you know what, folks? Well, while I was taking a break for a second, I was thinking, oh, I feel kind of bad that um, if you don't, you know, uh, if you're not a member on YouTube or if you don't back me on Patreon, you can't see the big super long ramble I'm going to do. But that's fine. I want to give a little bit more. So after we're done with this top 10, at the end of this video, I will give you in list format, so you can just go look these games up yourself on the uh, preview, which remember, there's a link for that down in the show notes. As a list, I'll tell you about, or I'll, I'll show you, um, what was it? 40 more games that just missed these two top 10s. So that'll give you a little bit more reading you can do for yourself. Um, and it'll be kind of a sneak peek of all the stuff I'm talking about in the ramble. Right, okay. So anyway, 
Let us now continue with my second top 10 of the Essen, the games I'm most excited about that I have not played, and I would very, very, very much like to. Okay, let's get going with number 10, Oath Sworn. And now, this is the only one that I have some kind of uh, real understanding because... Uh, Shea Parker, who's a contributor for the channel, did a fantastic run-through. And I should have been doing this all along. I am just going to go to Shea's video. And um, let's see, where is that? There it is. Yeah, Brandon. Ten days ago, Shea's video went up. And uh, man, I fell so in love with this game, I ended up joining him for the final thoughts. Because I really was really very engaged by this. But uh, this is a big, epic cooperative fantasy adventure game. Players are all working as part of a team trying to take down a series of boss monsters and in between big epic fights doing leveling up and adventuring stuff, storytelling, all the rest of it. Um, I had always been interested in it, but I thought, well, okay. I, I looked at it when it was on Kickstarter and like, I, I just don't know. It Does it have enough to pull me away from the stranglehold that Gloomhaven has over my heart? And I kind of said, you know what? I don't think I'll cover it. Shay, why don't you cover this then when we finally got a, co a review copy of it? Shay loves it. And Shay has made me fall in love with it too. And made me regret some life decisions. Because here's the deal, folks. I'm putting this on the list because, as far as I know, this is not available in retail. This was available in the first Kickstarter campaign. If they ever do another Kickstarter campaign, you'll be able to get it that way. But the game is too big uh, and too expensive to produce for, for the small publisher to be able to get it into local friendly game stores. So, if you don't want to back a crowdfunding campaign to get this, you kind of have to pick it up at a convention. So... I want this. I would very much like to play this someday myself because the the core boss battle gameplay is great, especially because they give you the option to say, hey, I'm going to roll dice and hope for the best when I decide what my attack is and maybe I'll roll well, maybe I won't. Or you can jettison the dice and instead use a Gloomhaven mechanism where you draw cards to um, find out, okay, did I get plus one? Did I get minus one? And you can push your luck with it. It's very, very sharp. And watching Shay play, I thought, oh my gosh, that's so nicely done. So much better than I thought it was going to be. But what really draws me in more than that is the way that they handle, um, you know, multiple players, because uh, no matter what, whatever player count you play with, there will always be four adventurers. And that was one of the reasons why I saw it. It's like, oh, if I'm playing a blue character with my wife, I don't want to have to put, d d d run two adventurers at the same time and basically be having to manage two different hands of cards and all the rest of it. I hate that. But Oathsworn does it so brilliantly. If you're playing a two-player game, I've got my lead hero, which is really where all the focus is, all the engine building and, uh, you know dice worker placement and card play and you know, all the really fun stuff. And then I've got a follower who is basically the other side of that character card who has very, very simple rules. And it feels like, you know, uh, my Pancho Villa, uh, you know, a, a kind of thing. And I love that. And, um, you know, if you want to play solo, yeah, you've got your lead character and you have three followers who are playing this simpler, more straight, uh, streamlined game. Uh, Shay did a solo run through to show how it works and it's gorgeous. It's wonderful. I absolutely love this. And I think, all games, I've seen so many games over the years say, oh yeah, if you want to play two, well, you have to control two players worth of stuff, and good luck. I hate that. I love Oathsworn for this. The other thing I love about Oathsworn is, uh, like a lot of these games, it has an event deck. Hey, every round a new event comes out. And like, Mleh. It's fine. I mean, that's what people like to do to have a little bit of unpredictability. But what I love about Oathsworn, and very few games do this, is, hey, I know what the event is this round at the beginning of the round. So I've got the whole round. And if I recall correctly, I'd have to go back and look. Maybe I even know what next round's event is as well. So you can do pre-planning so that the game becomes much richer and more strategic and less tactical. And that's fantastic too. So all that stuff combined... Man, I should have been showing our videos for that whole first half. Sorry, folks. Anyway, um, all that stuff combined makes me so in love with... I mean, again, Shea did an amazing job. You can go watch the run-through. Uh, and although this is it, because the next nine games, I'm going to have to rely entirely on board game geek pictures. Hopefully, there's going to be some good ones in there. So, uh, number 10, Oath Sworn. And again, if you're at all interested in it after Shay's run through, and if you're going to be at Essen, bear in mind, it's going to be hard to get if you're not at a convention or some future Kickstarter or crowdfunding campaign. All right, then let's move on to number nine. Number nine, Starship Captains. I mentioned earlier, I'm a huge, huge Star Trek fan. Oh, it's such a golden, wonderful time to be a Star Trek fan right now. Lower Decks is so amazing. And while there's been some hit and misses with the other live shows, can't complain too much uh, because it's just more Star Trek. Yes, please. How about then um, Check Games Edition bringing out Starship Captains? Now, this is very Star Trek adjacent. 
because this is not a licensed property, but there is no two ways about it. This game, the uh, the art style, the uniforms, everything about this game screams Star Trek, and I am there for it. I want uh, to be piloting something that is very, very much not the uh, the Enterprise. Not even remotely looks like the Enterprise. Um, you know, commanding a crew of talented individuals that don't look anything like Starfleet um, uh, uh, characters at all. Nothing at all. Um, and try to solve all kinds of problems of the week in uh, you know this wonderful little cooperative game. I have to admit, I have not done enough due diligence. I don't actually know how the gameplay works. Obviously, we jet around the galaxy. We all have our own starship. We all have our own crew. Oh, oh my gosh, is it co competitive then? I assumed, I mean, because you think Star Trek, you think co-op. I assume it's a competitive game then. Okay, like I said, I have not done research on this because I don't need to. Check Games Edition. They've got a free pass for me. Whatever they put out, I know it's going to be brilliant. It always is. Star Trek, yes, please. Beautiful, colorful, um, happy, upbeat world, yes, please. I um, am there for it. And uh, yeah, so uh, you know, in the first list, we had uh, Federation, where you get to take care of the politics side. And now you've got your Starfleet side if you want a little bit more action in your uh, future utopias. And that's Starship Captains. Very, very excited for this. Okay, then let's move on to uh, number eight on the list, Lacrimosa. And oh, uh, I have this. It's literally in the room and I've run out of time. My wife, she just went on a four-day glass retreat. I was hoping to get it played with her before she left so I could actually maybe put it on the other list because it looks really, really good, but I didn't quite make it. What is it? Well, first of all, it's the latest big box from DeVere. And man, folks, DeVere have been killing it for the last couple of years with amazing production and really solid designs, very well considered. Um, you know, again, just look at last year's Botoku or um, you know, Red Cathedral. Uh, DeVere is on a tear, and Lacrimosa is their latest big box game, and it looks amazing. It is about... The uh, after the death of Mozart, we are former patrons of the maestro who are um, trying to contribute to the completion of the Lacrimosa, his last work, which he literally on his deathbed was still writing. And while we're not, uh, when we're not actually, you know, uh, hiring our, our, our you know, musicians or you know, great composers to work on it in kind of a very cool area control game, uh, we are instead uh, traveling around Europe, recollecting all of our the fondest memories of the maestro uh, and because uh, there's we're actually working for Mozart's widow who uh, wants to do a uh, posthumous uh, biography. So she needs all our stories. So we're traveling around remembering things and um, also doing an area control game. So I love the theme. It all sounds very lovely and charming, but let's see if there's a picture showing what I really love about it. And so far, no. Still no. Show me the player boards. You're not showing me the player... Okay, this'll do. This'll do. <laughs> um, here's a player board, right? Uh, I already talked about this in, uh, what was it? The number one on the previous list, Revive. The idea of multi-use cards. That you can slot them into the top of your board to do the top action, or you can slot them into the bottom of your board and do the bottom action. And a Lacrimosa does this, just like Revive did. And I loved it so much in Revive. It's so good that I cannot wait to play Lacrimosa with my wife when she gets back from this class retreat um, to see how does it feel? How do they do this differently? I, so I'm, I know... I'm already predisposed to enjoy the gameplay. I expect they'll do different things than Revive. I know I really, really am entranced by the uh, the story the game tells. And the components are great, too. I did actually an unboxing of this on the channel, was it two weeks ago, I think? Um, so, I mean, it looks great. I suspect it plays great. Devere, again, they seem to be able to do no wrong, which is why Lacrimosa comes in at number eight. Okay, then let's go on to number seven, Tribes of the Wind. I will not deny the fact, folks, that the, one of the reasons this is on the list is because of the artist, uh, Vincent Dutre, the greatest board game artist working today. Apologies to everybody else. Or, no, no, is the Miko the greatest? Uh, you know, one of the greatest. Uh, I also love the Miko. And it looks like I've hit the wrong end of that. I need to go the other way for pictures. Okay. Show me a picture of the game, please. Do not show... I, yes, I, yes, that's a lovely box. Okay, this will do. Um, here's the deal. I'm really entranced by the game. 
because it's a gorgeous, gonna be gorgeous. Uh, hey, like Revive, this is another thousands of years, generations in the future. Uh, mankind has reverted to a more primitive state, and we're rebuilding the world and all that. Seems like that's kind of a hot topic these days. Hmm, I wonder why. I wonder if there's anything making happening in the world for the last few years that has made designers try to envision a uh, coming back in a more positive future after the mankind's inevitable downfall. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, regardless of all that, here's the crux of the game. Um, we have a bunch of cards we want to play to gather resources and do various and sundry actions to build up our future tribes uh, in a successful way. And of course, oh my gosh, it looks so gorgeous, right? That's cool. But here's the trick. If I want to play a card on my uh, out of my hand, um, yo, and slot it under different slots on my board, I've already said I love that, don't I? And there's another one doing it in a different way. Um, I have to look at the backs of the cards to my player to the left and the player to the right. That's why they're showing, hey, I've got hand card hands, I want to play it. But I can only play this card if I have more flames... Um, than either of my opponents. So in this case, oh, the person to my left has two flame cards. The other one has one. I've got three flame cards. Okay, I can play this now. Or, oh no, I don't. I can't play this because my opponent to the right has, um, yeah, has, uh, you know, I, I haven't beat him. So I have to wait for him to play one of his flame cards and now I can finally play it. I love this idea. This um, kind of almost Hanabi-esque thing going on where, um, you know, I, I have to pay attention to the backs of other people's cards in a competitive game where it, it's almost like normally in these sorts of games, oh, I got to get all my resources or I've got to have, you know, cards I can discard to do other things. In this game, it's not about what I've got. It's about what you've got. And do I have more? Do I have less? Sometimes cards say, oh, do I have the, uh, the, the fewest water cards amongst anybody? Then, okay, I can do this. I think that's really, really great. The, the, oh, the landscape is changing based on what other players are doing and you're trying to overcome these obstacles. I, I haven't played it yet. Of course, that's the notion of all of these, but I'm so in love with this idea, and I know it's going to be gorgeous looking, that there was no way I could not put tribe, uh, Tribes of the Wind on the short list. It comes in at number seven. And then we go on to number six. Twelve Rivers from a, you know a, a, a little unknown publisher, a, you know, small little indie publisher, a, a relatively new designer, I believe. Oh my gosh, folks. I will not deny the gimmick of this game pulled me in. What is the gimmick? It is the board. This is a three-dimensional board that represents a big, what do you call them, tributaries? A whole bunch of little rivers that all merge into one big river, right? This is something you see all over the place. This is a very real-world consideration. Here's the deal. Um, you can kind of consider this a worker placement game because during um, the round, you are placing these little dam pieces in different spaces in all the different tributaries. Is that right? Is it tributary? Tell me down in the comments if I'm saying this correctly. I should have looked it up beforehand. But you're putting them um, in different spots. Uh, certain spots will give you different uh, items and whatnot. So you're doing all of this because at the end of the round, after everybody's placed all their workers and gotten whatever they're going to get out of them, unleash the marbles! There are a bunch of marbles behind a big dam up at the top. You can see there's the dam. Oh, I should make this big bigger. You can see the dam in the picture. Behind this dam are a bunch of marbles just waiting um, for the lifted down. Although in this picture, they've already got some apparently... Uh, I mean, did they glue those? Um, anyway, the important thing is you lift it up and pachinko uh, parlor style, all the marbles start coming down and, um, you know, end up stopping in different places. And whoever um, got the, you know, whoever got to the dam first is going to find out what they get, but you don't know where everything is going to fall. I love this idea. Uh, I know my wife will love this to pieces. And I think that's all you get. Yeah, okay. Um, I, I, I cannot wait to give this a go. It just seems so wonderful and delightful. Maybe it's going to be a little cutthroat because as you can see, for all these different tributaries, there's multiple slots. So somebody could get our head. But will they get the first marble? Which marble will they get? Will they get the one I was hoping for? Because, of course, you're trying to do different set collection elements to get the resources you need to get the job done in typical Euro format. But, um, you know, all that aside, I will not deny, if I were at Essence Spiel and a game like this makes me wish I was at Essence Spiel, I would definitely like to give this a go. Um, just look at it. It's going to be so much fun every round. I mean, the toy factor. But then it seems like it's got some very interesting, you know, Euro-y tough decisions to make as well, which is why 12 Rivers, it's a bit of a gamble, but I like what I see so far, comes in at number six. All right, then. Let's move on to number five, Discordia. Okay, so this, I actually talked about this game, I think, a few months ago on the r, &R show with Ruel Gaviola, my uh, partner in crime, my number one co-host. Uh, the reason it's on my list is pedigree. 
It is from designer Murren Eisenstein. Who is the designer of one of my top 10 games of all time? Peloponnese. Peloponnese is the greatest auction game the industry has ever seen. Nothing has ever eclipsed it. And it's not like Burn is a one-hit wonder. He has produced a lot of really phenomenal designs over the years. I've always been impressed, even when I didn't like them, because maybe they had a little bit too much cutthroat in them. I'm always up for a new Burn Eisenstein design. And, um, you know, this one has a lot of interesting stuff going on. It's a very big, as he often does, big, deep, crunchy game. But one thing that's interesting about this game compared to his other stuff is it's pretty. It's colorful. Um, you know, his publisher, his little independent publisher, Iron, um, Iron, Iron Games, I believe, usually... His games are great to play, but not the best lookers. But this one actually looks really um, colorful and bright and charming. It is a tiling game where you're um, you know, building up uh, your tableau, but you're also trying to um, you know, create worker placement spots for dice. It's a dice worker placement game where you are building a dice worker placement board dynamically throughout the game, and it's from the designer of Peloponnese. That's enough for me. I think this game is going to be fantastic, and um, you should definitely check it out. It is one that's already on its way to me, so I hope to have it covered by the end of the year. I wish it was here now. I wish I could have gotten a chance to play it, because I suspect, based on Burns' um, past efforts, it probably would have made the other, the first short list. But as it is, uh, it comes in at number five on this list, Discordia. Oh, yeah. Okay. Right? What was that? That was number five. Okay. Then, uh, help Rome build glorious cities on the Rhine River. Okay. Let's move on to number four. Combinations. This, everything I just said, uh, a plot about Burned, uh, Eisenstein, and, um, you know, his, his games goes the same for designer Corn Van Morsel and his little independent publisher, Quali. I have always super duper impressed by Corn's designs. Um, and again... Korn's designs are not always the prettiest games, but they are always some of the best. In fact, Habitats is one of probably my top three or four greatest tile-laying games of all time. And um, Korn is back doing new tile-laying as well. It looks to me kind of like it has sort of a hexa hexagonal... Um, kind of a, what do you call it, suburbia vibe going on. Because what we're doing is every turn we are drafting these domino, these hexagon dominoes that are one, two, or three spaces big, and they have different, you know, forests and river or, and lakes and cities on them. And then they also occasionally have, um, what do you call it? Uh, let's see if I can get in a little bit closer. A little bit closer, not much. Uh, they've got you know, uh, scoring things that say, hey, if you've got this thing that you want stuff like this in your city or in your forest or in your little biome you're creating for yourself, in your combination. So as you're grabbing these tiles, you are trying to squeeze them in as best you can because they're all kinds of funky shapes. You're trying to make big continuous groupings of lakes and forests and cities, but you are also slipping in these bonus scoring things, faces, that um, will have certain requirements as well. So I suspect this is going to be great. Again, I'm mostly basing this on Habitats, one of the greatest tile land games of all time. I suspect this one will be good as well. Corn does not do bad designs. And um, the world should celebrate him more, even if he didn't really put a lot of interesting pictures on Board Game Geek. Of course he didn't. Um, but... There's also a really interesting element to this game with the way you draft these tiles that you're grabbing, because whichever tile you grab is going to... You can see that, oh, if I grab tile number three, that's going to bring this t other tile into the draft. So if I take this one, I will bring this one in that you might really want. So there's a little bit more going on with the drafting than a regular game of, oh, there's just four things, pick one, a new one comes out. Because the new one that comes out is chosen by you based on the one you chose for yourself. And I really like that idea too. So I suspect great things from Corn and Quali Games. And this is another one of those games, folks, that is going to be in very, very limited supplies. Even though, I mean... This is going to be one of those unheard of gems that every, you know, when people say, well, what, did, what really surprised you? Everybody's going to say combinations. If people discover, they're going to say, wow, this is amazing. And people say, oh, I should go check it out. And sorry, it sold out because they only have a thousand copies of it. And a bunch of those copies have already sold on a crowdfunding thing. I'm not quite sure of the particulars, but if you like Tile Land Games, I suggest you check it out at the show sooner than later. Number four, combinations. Now let's move on to number three. Scott Alms teams up with uh, Pegasus Spiel, Deep Print Games, and Capstone Games, couldn't think of the name for a second, to bring us Beer and Bread, where two villages face off in the traditions of brewing beer and baking bread. And I have to admit, I mean, we, my wife is a bre uh, bread baker. Uh, 
any week, you will smell delicious bread, uh, you know, garlic bread, cheese bread, uh, you know, and we're always eating it too much because we're supposed to be low carbers, but we can't help ourselves. Jen loves baking bread. We don't care about brewing beer. So I have to admit, at first, I was a little put off by this game because I was thinking, oh, there's literally half of this game I have no interest in. But then I saw it was designed by Scott Alms. He's a great designer. I'm always interested in what he's doing. It's a two-player only game that is actually a fairly crunchy uh, Euro with a lot of interesting stuff going on. And um, while I haven't played it, here's the deal, folks. The number one thing that brings this in so high is Capstone Games. I've, I've mentioned a couple of publishers that are on a tear. Capstone Games is maybe on the teariest tear of all time. They are just bringing out the best, the best of the best of the best of the kinds of games Jen and I love. Crunchy, crunchy Euros. Uh, you know, they're finding them, they're working with other publishers, they're bringing them to a wider audience. And so, for me, if Capstone says, we're going to co-publish this thing, that is a stamp of excellence and quality that makes me um, stand up and take notice. And that's what really brings uh, beer and bread so high onto this list because of that Capstone touch. But we're not done yet, folks. Let's talk about number two, Joan of Arc, Orleans Draw and Write. And it breaks my heart. There are no pictures of this anywhere other than the cover art. Um, but you had me at a roll and write of Orleans. That's all I needed to know. I love Roland Wright's. Orléans is one of the greats of all time. Uh, you know, a wonderful bag builder. I've covered it several different ways over the years. And I would love to see uh, the core ideas taken out of a bag builder and brought into a Roland Wright. Although I think it is still a bag builder, if I recall correctly. Uh, you know, there's action drafting. Each round, a player follower tiles are pulled from a bag. So you're still pulling followers, but you're riding those uh, followers in roll and write style. And I am always intrigued to see what, how does roll and write change the core ideas of the game? Because, of course, once you write something in, you can't put them back in the bag. So that always changes the flows. It, it you know, creates more tension and drama and excitement. People think, oh, roll and rights are a flash in the pan. People don't understand. Roll and rights are kind of like mini legacy games because every choice can't be undone. You have to live with your consequences of your actions, which is one of the things uh, that draws me in. And uh, you know, a, a roll and write version of one of the great Euros of all time, you better believe I want to check that out, even if they're being particularly um, circumspect and not really showing anything about the game. Even still, it comes in at number two, uh, Joan of Arc. Orleans, draw and write. But number one, folks, hey, you're wondering, do I have no love? For, St or for Uwe Rosenberg. Of course I have love for Uwe Rosenberg. Actually, he has several new games at the show. I'll be talking more about his other games in the ramble. But of all the games he's got at the show, Ottawa is the big one for me. From Lookout Games, that's another stamp of quality. Lookout Games has very, very rarely put out a stinker. They tend to put out really great stuff. And when Uwe Rosenberg works with uh, Lookout Games, you get some of the greatest um, Euros of all time. This is, yes... Yes, folks, it's another farming simulation. But uh, it's very interesting. In that, what, what is the setting? Uh, I, I think it talks about it in the description. Um, it's about bats. It's about farming with bats in southeastern Ghana, where the farmers have learned to not treat the bats as pests, uh, but to actually use them in their farming techniques because that's sweet, sweet guano. And I love that story brought into board game form. I love a good, heavy, crunchy Uwe Rosenberg farming simulation. I love these meeples. I love the bats. I love the goats. I think I'm going to love everything about this game. For many, many years, you can see it's advanced level. Oh, an a, a quote advanced level Uwe Rosenberg game from Lookout? I am there. There's no way I am not going to check that out. There's no way that doesn't come in near at the top of my list. I don't need to know the mechanisms. Although it looks like there's some really cool, interesting stuff with, you know, uh, dynamically generated player boards for your worker placement. And oh, actually, it kind of, looking at these pictures, has kind of a Gates of Lo Yang vibe, too, with all of your um, farmlands that you fill up. And oh, wow. Folks, um, again, I. I I read through 1,183 games to make this list. I'm sorry I did. Some games I'm just like, that's a that's an insta that's an insta buy. I don't need to know more. And uh, Ottawa, because of the subject matter, because of the pedigree, uh, because of the background, because of my love of the sub, uh, because of my because of the. Because, because because I love farming. Of I love farm. I don't love farming in real life, but in board game form, with Uwe Rosenberg, yes, please. Especially when it's a big, heavy, crunchy one, which is what Ottawa promises to deliver. And oh my goodness, I did it, folks. That was 20 games. But remember, 
halfway through, I promised, now let me make sure uh, this should work. Um, look on the right side of the screen when I switch scenes. Where is it? It's this one. Boom! Look at that! I set up a scroll! Here's 20 more games that I've already played. Don't worry if you missed them. Uh, this is gonna, this is just gonna be on a loop. There's 20 more games, there they go, that, um, I seriously considered bringing into the top 10 that I played. And then, here's 20 more games that I have not played that I seriously considered bringing into the top 10 of what I played. So, that's just going to keep on going. And, uh, you know, you now have some homework. The link is down in the show note. You can go look up any of these games. Those, all those first ones, I have done videos for all of them. So, you can go watch all these second ones. I have not done videos for any of them. So, you'll have to be more on your own. But hopefully, that's just a little bit more fun stuff for you folks to enjoy. And I am done. Except I'm not done. I'm going to take a little break. And then I got to sit down for it's probably going to take me two or three hours to uh, film the ramble. Uh, cause so, I, I got to talk about all these. I got to go into detail about all these. I got to go into detail about, um, all the games that are at the show that are already widely available. I'm still going to talk about them. I got to talk about the expansions. Am I going to talk about the games to demo? I'm not sure, but there's a lot more. And again, um, by the time you see this, there's an eye up there. If you want, if you're a member, uh, you can, you know, hit the eye to go to the member ramble, yeah, or you can hit the eye and go to Patreon and back even for just a month, uh, just to watch the extended if you're interested, but either way, folks. Hopefully, uh, this was of some use to you. Hopefully, you had a good time. And, uh, yeah, hopefully uh, something else that's appearing on the screen right now, or, uh, like, you know, this subscribe button might have caught your interest. And, uh, what the heck, there'll be something right there. And, uh, you know, if you just want to watch something else right now, go ahead and click that. And, uh, oh man, I'm thirsty. <laughs> I am so thirsty. And I've got 20 seconds to run out the clock, so go ahead and click. I'm done talking.